up guys, welcome to another episode of Spark to Fire. I'm Landon Rhodes, your host, and this show is all about people taking concepts and ideas into reality. In this show, we're gonna interview studs like Aaron Davis and lots of different people that have taken you know, their vision into a reality and really just like rose to the top of their field and their craft. And I'm sitting here next to a professional speaker, author, entrepreneur, and attitude expert, Aaron Davis. His vision, his mission, excuse me, his mission is to change the world one attitude at a time. Aaron, thank you so much for coming on the show, my man. Thanks, Lennon. Good to be Dude, here, brother. Yeah, so cool to have you here. Um, I, I just got to start off and, you know, we usually start this off in saying, like, what is your origin story? Where did it all start for you? You know, it started for me here in Lincoln, Nebraska. I was born and raised here. Um, the youngest out of six kids, four boys, two girls. Uh, my parents moved here in 1963 from Pittsburgh, PA, Pennsylvania. So I've uh, been here for a long time. Obviously, I was born in 63, uh, but been born and raised here. Went to um, high school here, uh, University of Nebraska, and uh, met my wife in college. And uh, her hometown's about two and a half hours to the north, I'm sorry, to the west of here. And uh, we decided to stay. We enjoy living here. I love Nebraska. Besides the cold. <laughs> I love Nebraska. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I enjoy it, man. We have uh, two college-age sons, a uh, high school daughter, and uh, a little bulldog named Samson that's always sleeping. Awesome. <laughs> so life is good, man. No complaints. <laughs> that's great. That's great, man. So I, I want to hear, like, so this is the, the early ages stuff. So, like, what, what was it like for you when you were, um, when you were growing up? What, mm -hmm. what was your environment when you were growing up? What, mm -hmm. what, I'm basically trying to understand what made you Aaron Davis today. You know, I had a great childhood. You know, um, there were six of us, and, you know, my, there was a, wasn't a lot of money growing up, but we had a lot of love growing up. You know, my dad um, uh, moved to Nebraska, like I said, in 63 with my mom, and my oldest brother was just a baby at the time, a very young baby at the time. Um, and they moved here out of tragedy, if you would. Uh, back in Pittsburgh, my dad's older brother uh, was murdered, and oh, wow. his other older brother was stationed here in Nebraska in the military, in the Air Force. And uh, uh, asked my father, I kind of almost begged my father to get out of Pittsburgh and move to someplace a little more tranquil, safer, etc. And so they moved out here, and uh, my father didn't have a, a high school uh, diploma, no college degree. Uh, but had one heck of a work ethic mm -hmm. and uh, became a man of faith a few months after he moved here. And uh, so I was raised with some solid principles. And uh, anytime I've swayed, I couldn't say I didn't learn. I didn't know better. You know, so right. I, yeah. I had a great childhood growing up, man. We uh, uh, three bedrooms. My mom and dad had a room. My two sisters shared a room and me and my three brothers shared a room and two bunk beds. They were about these close together. <laughs> so, <laughs> but you know what, man, we played outside. You yeah. know, that place that kids don't understand anymore, outside. Yeah, outside. Where you get grass stains. <laughs> you need patches on your jeans, you know, right. uh, uh, and things of that nature. So, you know, I had a great childhood, man. We, Our backyard was the Kool-Aid house. You know, a lot of people don't understand that now, but that meant everyone came to your house. And my mom uh, would always tell people she's not worried about the grass. She's not growing grass. She's growing kids. Amazing. And she always Love knew that. who we were, you know, because everyone would gravitate towards our house. So... Our backyard was the football was a football field. It was the baseball uh, diamond. It was the dirt track. So um, cool. Our basketball court was not your traditional basketball court you may see in the suburbs. Our basketball court was a tree that stood at the end of an old cement pavement that we used to garage used to be at that was Raz, and so we used that slab as our basketball court, and we hung the hoop, the rim, on the tree. So the backboard was tree bark. So we seen a real basketball hoop. Man, we got big. It's like, man, this thing is big. You have a real backboard yeah, yeah, now. I went yeah. to the gym. But we didn't know any better. So we just had fun with what we have. And I use that today uh, as a businessman. Never allow a lack of resources to stop you from being resourceful either. Regardless if you're in business for yourself or not, never allow a lack of resources to stop you from being resourceful because we were very resourceful. Yeah. Um, so I had a great childhood, man. I was involved in sports. Obviously, my dad, he was a janitor, but he also was a pastor at a small church, very small church. Um, so I was in church on Friday night, uh, choir rehearsal Saturday morning, Sunday school Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon service, Sunday night service. So I was in church a lot. All right. Um, but I had a great childhood, man. Like I said, I'm the youngest out of six kids, and uh, we're a very tight-knit family. Mm -hmm. uh, we never, like I said, not a lot of uh, money, but we, my father was very resourceful, you know. So, you know, it was, it was something in that I was very fortunate and blessed to have my dad at home. 
uh, not even just in the black community, but in any community right now, uh, there's a lot of homes where they don't have a father there. Right. You know, unfortunate circumstances happen. And I understand that. But I was fortunate to have my mom and dad growing up uh, throughout my life. So although I had pictures of, you know, Magic Johnson and Michael Jordan uh, on my wall and posters, I didn't have to look further than, you know, the four walls of my home to see who my hero was. It was my dad. That's you know, amazing. So I was very fortunate to grow up with a great home. So man. you went from playing basketball with uh, the hoop is a tree. Or yeah. the tree is a hoop, excuse me. And uh, you went from there to then, you know, going into college and talk a little bit about uh, college life. College life was awesome, man. High school life was awesome, too. As a kid, though, uh, here in Nebraska, I know some of you listening from other parts of the country, other parts of the world, but Nebraska, we have no pro football teams. There's no pro uh, basketball teams. There's no pro sporting teams in the state of Nebraska. Um, but we do have Nebraska football, which is the creme de la creme of sports in our state. It is the, uh, the porch light, if you would, to our state. Mm -hmm. And so growing up about three miles away from the Husker football stadium, on game day Saturdays, we'd be in the backyard that that place called outside again. <laughs> <laughs> we, you know, the neighborhood would be outside in the backyard playing football, and we couldn't afford to go to Nebraska football games on a regular basis. You know, the tickets are too expensive, et cetera. But Nebraska would score, Landon, and all of a sudden we would just hear, Oh, that's awesome. <sighs> that's so cool. We'd hear the fans, they start <laughs> chanting, Go Big Red, B -b -b Go Big. And so it gave me chills as a kid. And I'm like, man, that's amazing. one of these days, I said, I want to play for Nebraska. And I had an opportunity to play for Nebraska, which was a lot of fun. I wasn't a superstar starter, but I had a chance to, to win a national championship with them in 1994. I remember the first time letting see my jersey with my name on the back in my locker. Coming in from a Friday practice, and you're there getting your stuff prepped for the next day. And I look and I open my locker, my, you know, my name's on the back, Davis, number 83. And it was, it was an, an amazing feeling, man you know, to have that come true. So um, it was an amazing experience, bro. So talk, ab talk about how, how that sort of like that level of leadership, like talk about the leadership that you received when you were there and like what that did to your career today. Well, the type of leadership we had then was, um, was amazing. And I tell you, 18, 19, 20 years old, even 21 years old, and, and at where I was at at that time, I didn't understand the significance and the blessing it was to really be in that type of culture and that environment. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, I'm biased because Coach Osborne was my coach, but I think he's the greatest coach to ever coach college football. Mm -hmm. um, Many would agree with you. Oh, yeah. And here you have us in Nebraska, you know, middle of the United States. We have no pro entertainment to draw athletes. Uh, it gets extremely hot. It gets extremely cold. Um, it's not a huge metropolis town. Lincoln, uh, especially during this time, now we're pressing probably 300,000, mm -hmm. you know, maybe a, a tad over, a tad under. Uh, we weren't pressing 300,000 when he was the coach here. So all of these things that other states could brag about or at least enhance uh, athletes to come. Coach Osborne had none of those things, but he had the most important thing, integrity. And he had a plan, and he was ahead of the curve, in my opinion, 20, 30 years. Mm -hmm. So to play under with the leadership that he displayed was amazing. And I think it helps me out now because back then, under Coach Osborne and his amazing team that he had as assistant coaches, and I, one of the things I've, out of many things I've learned about leadership, you must surround yourself with people who are better and brighter than what you are mm -hmm. in those particular areas. If you were the one to where you have all the answers, uh, you're in trouble. Right. You know, and even if you're not, your business or your, uh, your organization or you as an individual are only going to go so high. You got to surround yourself with people uh, who know more than what you do. If you're always the, the brightest person in the room, you got the wrong crowd you're hanging out with. You need to find another room. Hundred um, percent. And if you can't, if that if that's something that bothers you, uh, you're in trouble. You know. So Coach Osborne surrounded himself with amazing people. His circle. He had an amazing circle of people around him, and they created a culture of responsibility, a culture uh, that uh, of excellence, if you would. Mm -hmm. um, we, I hated losing. We hated losing more than the thrill of victory. Yes, we hated losing more than we enjoyed winning. When you, when losing doesn't bother you that much, there's a problem. Right. I don't want to lose in checkers. Right. Let alone in the game where, you know, I was on a scout team. Scout team, folks, means I was on the meat squad, they call it sometimes. I, mean, I got mm -hmm. my tail beat every day by the first team defense. I mean, and football is not a contact sport, especially now. Uh, but football is not a contact <laughs> sport. And I understand why they've made some of the changes. I, I do understand that. But it's a collision sport. Right. And I loved it. But uh, if you're laying your body on the line every day in practice, why not give the best you got? 
And it's the same mentality I talk towards business. Have I always been that way? No, but I've had the pedigree in me that if you're going to do something, do the dang thing. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, half tail effort gets half tail results. You got to go for it or don't go for it. If you're going to the gym, go to the gym, work out. You know, if you're going to write the book, write the book. If you're going to be the best manager, be the best manager. You're going to be the best leader, mom, dad, whatever it may be, be the best at what you do or why do it? And where, where does that, where does that fire come from? Like you talked about having work ethic when you were growing up, but yeah. like, where does this fire in you come from? Because you're, you know, in the, in the prime of your career right now and you're speaking more than ever, you're gone. I literally call you, I'll text you. I'm like, Hey bro, sorry. Out of town again. Out of town. <laughs> next time. <laughs> Catch you next week. And like, and I love that because yeah. I see you moving and shaking and like, that just makes me want to work harder. Yeah. And so what drives you personally now? Um, as, as you've evolved in your career, because it's mm -hmm. easy, like when you're around those studs, like it's pretty easy to stay driven when oh, you're yeah. around these, you know, just freak athletes, everybody that's, you know, like they're just fired up to be there. Mm -hmm. What motivates you now outside mm -hmm. of that? You know, it, it's, it's, it's amazing in that in life you go through different stages, you know, um, it starts with your why, you know, it's, it starts with why you do with what you do. You know, if you don't have a strong why you often lose your way. And we're all going to lose our way. But when your why is strong, you get back on that path pretty quick. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, the, the, the fire was, for me, pain was a big part of that. You know, uh, the initial flame was started, you know, just my parents had a great upbringing. And watching my father bust his tail for years as a janitor, didn't make a lot of money. But for 40 plus years, man, he mopped floors, cleaned out bathrooms, cleaned toilets, wiped down mirrors. Um, and he did it with tenacity. Mm -hmm. You know, Martin Luther King has an old quote that said, if you're going to be a street sweeper, be the best street sweeper. You know, to hear a man that sweeps streets, his quote is amazing. And my father took that same approach to where he took pride in every floor that he mopped. Mm -hmm. He took pride in every mirror that he wiped down, every faucet and every sink that he wiped down. It was going to be excellence. Um, so that, that carried over to me. And I, I watched how he carried himself. And he always stressed to us, it's not a matter of what you do, it's how you do something. Have passion behind it. Do it the right way. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's always lit my fire into where, and later in life, then that was the base getting from my mom and my dad, that work ethic and do be excellent in what you do. No matter, it's not what you do, it's how you do it. Be excellent how you do it. And he would always say, growing up, sometimes you have to pat yourself on the back and say, I'm a champion. You know, you don't have to scream to the world, I'm a champion, but you got to pat yourself on the back sometime and say, I'm a champion. You can make it. My father would do that sometimes. And I think about a man. Here he was. In fact, just four blocks down the street there, Center Park Road. Mm -hmm. My father cleaned two of those buildings, Pegler and Cisco, when it was there. Mm -hmm. And we were the potato chip factory. He goes, there were days to where I was ready to tackle a, a huge workload, emptying out hundreds of trash cans and say, I'm a champion. And here's the guy that's emptying out the trash cans. And society would say, well, he's a janitor. He's just a janitor. First of all, folks, there is no just, anything. no just anything. There is not, I'm just a house mom or I'm just a, no, no, you're doing an amazing work. And it's how we think. So my father really uh, started that foundation. My mom started that foundation. Then later on in life, I went through some pain. You know, pain is a teacher. Yeah. You know, pain is a teacher if you use it. And the lessons in the carnage of pain sometimes are elusive. They hide their stealth. The work is finding the lessons through the pain. There's always a message in the mess. Depends on if we want to get dirty and look for it, but Amen. it's worth it. Because you're going to get dirty anyway when you're dealing with pain. Mm -hmm. Pain is dirty, it's gruesome, it hurts. But there's always a message in the mess if you look for it. So I went through some painful experiences. My brother was killed on his bicycle, riding his bike downtown Lincoln, April 6th of 2009. Um, oh. I had some fraternity brothers uh, that, that, that died. One committed suicide. Uh, a, ch a childhood friend of mine died in a freak accident at a lake, you know, uh, drowned. Um, I've been the, the one that about sent me over the edge is when I lost my mom, you know, just over just under five years ago, died unexpectedly. Uh, soon after my mom passed that same year in September of 2014, uh, my cousin, she was murdered in December of that same year. She was basically an Uber driver out on the East Coast and was shot in the head for 150 bucks. Horrible. The losses just kept coming. My cousin died early. Uh, my nephew's wife died at 30. I mean, it was just on and on and on of just carnage, carnage, carnage. But to where that fire now is lit, the thing I learned a lot of things. The good Lord has showed me a lot of things, even when I was angry. Because see, grief changes you. It rewires your mind. Right. And I'm out talking about the attitude of a champion. And there were times I'd put a mask on. I'd get on stage and put my mask on and hey, everybody get everybody fired up and ready to go. But inside, man, I was a hurting unit. I was angry. I was bitter. I was mad. And the more I began to see the deaths, the more also I began to see the sense of urgency. Kind of like me and you and AJ were talking about. Life, 
That old saying that life is short and live every day as if it's your last, those are no longer cliche sayings to me. No. No. I've seen rip too many times with people in the past 10 years in my own life and the people I know. I don't want to rest in peace yet. I want to live on fire right now Mm -hmm. because we only have a certain amount of time that we're blessed to be on this amazing journey called life. I want to use it. So you ask where the fire comes from, man, brother, I got a sense of urgency to live life. And I'm not talking about just work. I mean, man, when uh, tomorrow me and the family are going to Colorado to condo out there. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to live life. Yeah. You know, I'm not an outdoorsy guy if there's no golf there. But you know what? I'm going to hike the heck out of some of those trails. I'm going to sled <laughs> like I'm... Hike the heck out yeah. of the mountains. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The mountains probably... Oh, there's bears up there. I'm going to live. Like I said, you know what I'm saying? There's bears Keep up living. there. Keep living. Keep living, right? <laughs> I want to live life, man. Yeah. I'm going to go down those ski... Oh, no, down the slopes on the uh, the sled in the big bobsled. You know, I'm, I'm going to do it like uh, like I'm eight years old again. So that, that fire comes from loss, but it also comes from the foundation I was blessed and fortunate to have as a kid. Right. And what was your dad's advice? I mean, obviously, you know, he has a really great, great relationship with God mm-hmm. and you do as well. Oh, yeah. So like, what was his advice as you're going through all this struggle? Like how, how did he, what was his message to you during that time? My dad's message, and this is how he used to come. My dad has dealt with a lot of loss, man. I mean, his wife, his son, uh, sister that was murdered, brother that was murdered, um, he's been through a lot of loss. You know, when they first moved to Nebraska, their house was burned down. Mm-hmm. You know, a tremendous amount of loss. My father's faith in God, the number one thing, uh, was huge. But my father also said, grieve wisely. You're going to grieve. All of us are going to lose something in this life. Mm-hmm. But you have to learn to grieve wisely. And that means to grieve in a healthy way as well, surrounding yourself with people who are going to uphold you and hold you, hold you up and, and also hold you accountable too. Right. And, be the, and sometimes it's just someone sitting with you not saying a word just to know they're there for support. Mm-hmm. So my father taught me and still teaches me how to grieve wisely when you grieve. There's, there's a lot of ways to grieve. And everybody handles grief differently. Yeah. And there's no timetable to grieve. No. And my father's always told me there's no time limits or timetables. He goes, and, and people who feel that there are have never lost anybody that really cared about them because there is no time limit. So my father's taught me how to grieve wisely. I would say that's probably the best way I've to say I've never heard those two words put yeah. together that way. Yeah. Because you just, you look at it as a fact of life. You don't see it as something that you can affect change on or like yeah. that you can, that you can kind of like, it's an, it's attitude, you know, it which, is. which, you know, like goes back to your mission. You want to change the world one attitude at a time. Mm-hmm. It's your attitude. Absolutely. And so that kind of brings us to the next phase of your life after you know you've dealt with all this pain mm-hmm. and you were already you were already a professional speaker at this time right and you're moving on past this pain and so you're sitting here thinking like man I'm in pain like this is this is hard I'm grieving mm-hmm. I'm losing people left and right life seems to be taking advantage of me at this right. time it's a good way to say it yeah and 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 so now you're going out and you're speaking to companies, speaking to individuals, speaking to teams about how they need to adjust their attitude. Mm-hmm. And like, after hearing that story and after hearing all of your loss, like I don't see anyone that's more qualified to talk about that than mm-hmm. you. And so that make that makes me connect with you in a bigger way because I didn't really, I didn't know all of those stories. Yeah. And it's a horrible thing, but you, you somehow have found a way to make the best out of that mm-hmm. and to move forward and to grieve wisely. I know exactly what he's talking about when he says that, by the mm-hmm. way. Talking about substance, substance abuse, Absolutely. talking about alcohol, drugs, Absolutely. everything, tobacco. When you look at that, everybody turns to their vice. Mm-hmm. And to, and everybody's gonna have those regardless, but to, to curb that and right. to say like, not today. Like I'm not going to, I'm not gonna let that take me over and completely turn the direction of my life over to this direction just because I lost someone. Right. And so I think that's powerful. I think that's powerful mm-hmm. that you talked about that and I appreciate you sharing you it. Bet. So <clears throat> talk about you yourself as a business, as an entrepreneur now. Mm-hmm. What's that been like for you? Um, did you ever have a stint where you had a career within a business or have you always been kind of on your own entrepreneur making your own path? You know, when I first got out of high, uh, college, if you would, I got my degree in psychology and a minor in English from the University of Nebraska. Go Big Red. <laughs> so I got my degree in Nebraska. And when I first graduated from the university, I started working with youth, a youth organization called Campus Life. So I worked for Youth, youth, uh, youth for Christ Campus Life. Uh, it's one of the, um, um, and I love that, working with teens, man. I was a bl- And I still work with a lot of teens today at speaking at high schools and colleges, mm-hmm. et cetera. And then the speaking kind of started. You know, and it started, again, out of lost. Mm-hmm. You know, um, my childhood friend and roommate, another thing you didn't know, he was murdered in our house. 
In your house. In my house. Yeah, 1996. Murdered in our house. Um, bad to break up with his girlfriend. His girlfriend still had a key to our place and murdered him in our house while he was sleeping. Um, the speaking was the, that was kind of the genesis of me starting to speak in that I was asked to come speak about domestic violence. Right. You know, a few months after that, I'm like, no, I'm not. I, I didn't know anything about speaking. I didn't have any interest in it. Uh, definitely wasn't going to go talk about that. You know, didn't have no desire yeah. to go talk about that. Um, and I still deal with that in a lot of right. ways. You know, I still deal with that. Um, but I was asked shortly after that, I was asked the person, the same person asked, well, you don't have to come talk about that issue. Would you come talk about what it was like to plan a national championship football team? Right. I said, all right, I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Went and spoke and really enjoyed it. Then was asked by one of my former coaches at Nebraska, Coach Brown, um, would you come speak at this event in Seward, Nebraska? So I went out there and spoke at that. I said, we're going to give you 50 bucks. I was like, word? <laughs> you know? yeah, done. Done. Deal. I'll be there. <laughs> oh, there's that. There's that choir work coming back That's in, right? right? Yeah. Like, yeah. We got 50 bucks. Yeah. yeah you, guys, you guys missed out on that. We had, uh, we had, we had AD singing a little bit into the microphone, just testing things, testing things out for audio levels. So you got paid 50 bucks for a gig in your life. 50 life. bucks. And you're like, okay. I could, I could, there's something here. I was here. like, yeah, I could do there's that. There's something here. Because you didn't expect to get paid. No. And by the way, I think that's how a lot of great endeavors start. You do it because you appreciate the, yeah. the person that wanted you to do it, and you want to do it yourself. Absolutely. And you're like, wait, I can get paid to do this? Yeah. And then that unlocks something new. So talk about that. What was that like you, from that point forward? It was awesome in that I was beginning to get requests to say, could you come speak at this event or that event? And by the way, what are your fees? I, I had no idea mm -hmm. what they were talking about. That'd be like me walking back in your sound crew and saying, Aaron, figure this, I have no idea where you start. <laughs> so I started talking to some of my mentors, uh, Stan Parker, former player at Nebraska uh, back in the 80s, and obviously Coach Brown, mm -hmm. Coach Osborne, those guys who had been in the field and have done it before, uh, just figuring out price structure, fees, et cetera, and started doing it full time. Not, I mean, not full time, but doing a lot more than I was. Then I started doing sales as I was building and speaking with the Dale Carnegie Corporation. So I was doing some sales, you know, as far as uh, leadership development, sales development. And I learned a lot about sales myself mm -hmm. as I was selling about sales. Um, <laughs> it was amazing how that works. And this before there was internet, if you would. It was fetal stage. We didn't have, you know, Salesforce and all of We had index cards. Right. So what year are we talking? And paper rolling. We're talking like 1996, 1997. Internet's like a brain. It's like fetal. Just, just start. Green screen. Yeah, green screen. You know? right. <laughs> so you had to actually pick up the phone. There was no text messaging, right. none of that stuff to mm -hmm. where um, if your feelings got hurt by cold calling, if you didn't hear no, you weren't going, you're going to have skinny kids because you're not going to make it in sales. All right. <laughs> right. Empty refrigerator, yeah, skinny, skinny kids. kids. So I had I, I developed my skills, if you would, any skills that I may have, I developed them pretty raw and on the spot. The first thing I learned about in sales and to build my business out even today, talk less, ask more questions. Mm -hmm. Talk when you're in sales, talk less, ask more questions. Um, and I put an index card on my desk that said, ask a question, then shut up. Love there that. were times in meetings to where, especially on the phone, they were like, Are you still there? I'm like, Yep, I'm just listening. Then I'd ask them another question. They're like, man, this was a great conversation. Yeah, I'd like, really, I wasn't doing a lot of talking. I just asked you a couple just questions. Just asked me questions. Yeah. You ask better questions, you get better results. Right. I've always believed that, whether it's in sales, relationship, whatever, um, if you ask better questions, you get better results. Mm -hmm. um, and that's helped me a lot in my business today as an entrepreneur um, in that landing to where it's, it's about the attitude you take towards it. And that's what I speak about, mm -hmm. the attitude of a champion. And attitude is not the only thing, but it's the main thing. I've played with a lot of athletes, seen a lot of athletes, seen a lot of people in corporate America as well as the nonprofit world who had all of the tools, who were blessed with amazing talents, gifts, and abilities, mm -hmm. but had a horrible attitude. You can have the greatest abilities in the world, but your attitude negates all of those things if your attitude is bad. I've seen people get fired because their attitude was horrible. Mm -hmm. Horrible. People couldn't work with them, didn't want to be around them, but they had, had all the assets and tools to be amazing, but their attitude disqualified them. Yep. Your attitude is either an asset or a liability. It's one or the other. There is no in-between. Your attitude is an asset or a liability. That might be something that you guys want to hit that minus 15 seconds on the podcast app or go back 15 seconds <laughs> because uh, that's that's a huge, huge part of of why I wanted AD to come on today is because I remember the first time you told me that. Yep. And I was just thinking like, you have bad days. 
bad days Dang, are right? are absolutely going to happen, mm -hmm. but you have an opportunity and an, you, you can make an adjustment midday. Um, you're probably a big fan of Tony Robbins. I've oh, seen yeah. your stash of books. Yep. It's insane. <laughs> um, it's, it's incredible the amount of knowledge that this guy has in his head, and I'm glad we're getting to share some of this, but he talks about he talks about pain and pleasure and how mm -hmm. you go back and forth between the two. So you're either you know, seeking pleasure or avoiding pain. Right. And you, I think attitude has a lot to do with that, you know, Absolutely. because that's where people end up making their decisions. Mm -hmm. If you can make a phone call to your 20 year old self mm. today, what would you tell that's him? A great question. You know, it's a great question. It's in that I use it quite a bit on, I've actually have a screen uh, an image on a PowerPoint that I use when I speak in the audiences. And it's a picture of me in my uniform, my Oscar uniform. And there's this guy with these two gold chains that were fake. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I use that as a picture. And it's one of the, I'll, just, I'll send this to you later too. It says, what would you tell your younger self? I would tell my younger self to have a sense of urgency. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that, not running through life. I'm not saying that. Be quick, but not in a hurry with opportunities, with meeting people, with understanding that your 20s are going to be, tw you're gonna be, when you're, cause you can't wait till you're 21. Then when you're 21, you're just like, okay, I'm already 21. Then it's like when I'm 25, then when I'm, all these times, no, 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 now, now is the time to live. Not when you're 21, not when you're 25, not when you're 30, not when you retire, not saying one of these days I'm going to, because one of these days could be today. We don't know how much time we got on this amazing journey called life. Mm -hmm. So have a sense of urgency. Don't think that you got all the time in the world. What is all the time in the world? No one alive walking today can tell you when they're going to breathe their last breath. Right. None of us can. Mm -hmm. So have a sense of urgency. Man, if you're going to if you're going to go camping, man, go camp the heck out and camp. Yeah. If you work, then work the heck out. If it's work, so have a sense of urgency no matter what you do. Doesn't mean you're running through it. No, it means you're enjoying every bit of that moment. It's hard to do that all the times, but it's worth it. Yeah. I would tell my 20-year-old self, do you understand that you're playing on a national championship football team and you're playing for one of the greatest coaches to, that will ever coach the game? Mm -hmm. This is going to go fast. The unfortunate thing about that at times, those who get it, get it. Those who don't, unfortunately, they don't get it until they're a spectator. It was like, dadgum, that was a great time. I wish I would have. Woulda, coulda, shouldas are horrible. And you're trying to reduce as many of those Absolutely. as humanly possible. Absolutely. Like, I think about that a lot when I'm, you know, if ever I'm having a rough time or thinking about something or, you know, maybe it's like making a really like risky decision where mm -hmm. it's something like, hey, this is a ton of financial risk. Like I look at, I look at it as um, I'm 94 years old, I'm sitting in a hospital bed or I'm even just sitting in a nursing home somewhere and I'm looking back. Mm-hmm. Would I make this decision, or would I, you know, I would like I, that. would I go the safe route? I like and that. nine times out of ten, I'm pushing, pushing for yep. that decision. And I think about that a lot when I'm, whenever I'm making a decision that I'm, I'm looking back on, like, or even something simple, like going to talk to a girl at a bar. Would your yep. eighty, would your eighty-eight year old self stop? Like if, if that person could go back in time, would they stop? Absolutely not. <laughs> they, would have, they would have no reservations whatsoever. They would, they would get after it. So like that, I think about that a lot when I'm making, when I'm making decisions that way. Um, so anybody that's willing or that's you know, interested in going into uh, a speaking career or they're interested in even becoming their own boss, being an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them today? You know, regardless if it's a speaker or their own boss, uh, the thing that I would tell them is uh, spend some time to reflect on it. Not a lot of time. Too many people spend years reflecting about what they're going to do, what they're getting ready to do, what they're thinking about doing. Instead of doing it. Do it. Mm -hmm. Do your homework, then break the huddle. You know, in football, you only have 25 seconds, 40 seconds between plays. From the ball, that ball is down, the clock is starting. Mm -hmm. If you don't snap the ball in that time, you get a flag, you get a penalty. It's called delay a game. Too many people have delay of life penalties that are stacked up like crazy with yellow flags. Man. And, I'm, and me included. <laughs> How many of those you willing to take? Because eventually the game's over. Yeah. Well, you get four quarters in football. Yeah. Some of us, if you break it down to life, I'm basically at halftime of my life right mm -hmm. now. I'm 45 years old. Mm -hmm. You know, if we look at statistics and research, I got about until about, you know, 80 years old, 78 to 80. That means I'm at halftime right now. How many delayed games is going to take for me to see, man, break the freaking huddle? Mm-hmm. So when you're starting a business and you're huddling with advisors and taking notes, you're going to seminars, that's the huddle. You're getting your plan together. You know, you're getting the plays in, you're getting the resources, you're getting the research, you're surrounding yourself with a team, an accountant, a banker, et cetera. 
eventually you must break the huddle and run the play. Mm-hmm. Now, you don't know what the play is going to hold, but you sure as heck going to get the results if you don't break the huddle. Right. So don't allow fear to stop you from breaking because those penalties are coming left and right. And you know right. what those penalties are? Time. Yep. You can't get it back. Right. Run the play. I was I was listening to Jesse Itzler speak at a, at a big conference, and he talked about life in terms of like a bus that just keeps going. And he's like, mm. he's like, you have to look at you have to look at like you're on this bus ride. He's like, he draws a line out on the stage. He's like, it's going, it's going, it's going. You have no idea when it's gonna stop, and all of a sudden, just bam, mm. it's over. It's done. And he's like, you have to do as much as you possibly can with that sense of urgency that you talked about. Right. You need to be doing as much as you possibly can, and not saying, oh, it's okay, I'll wait until I'm 30 to start that business, because that's the time penalty you're talking about. Yep. Because you could have started that business, or you could have taken that risk, or taken that risk now. Mm-hmm. You can mess up, and you can always go back. You know, like you right. can always go back to what you were doing before um, in terms of like, you know, if, if it's a job or finding a new job. But I, that's one, that, my piece of advice for anybody that wants to start a business and that's real confident and that they know that they want to do. That's right. Understand the risks, but don't let them keep you out of the game. Absolutely. Run the yeah. play. Run the play. Run I love play. that. I love that mentality mm-hmm. of break the huddle and run the play. That's really, that's, that's great advice. Mm-hmm. That's great Appreciate advice. It. And we talked about who you look up to. And I'm really excited to hear him speak. He's actually coming in right after yeah. this. Uh, um, talk about talk about the impact your dad has had and how that relates to your new book that you're writing. Mm-hmm. You know, the impact, there's not enough words to even express. We don't have enough time. Yeah, yeah, yeah not enough time. <laughs> there, there's so many different things. And I would say um, one of the biggest things about my dad, uh, obviously, is his faith. I mean, amazing unmovable faith in God, man. It's huge. Um, and here's a man who's who's been through every amount of tragedy you could possibly think of. Not every amount you could possibly think of, but just some rough times, you know, losing a child. I mean, you're supposed to bury your, your, your kids are supposed to bury you, not mm-hmm. bury your kids. Right. Uh, especially at 46 years old. You know, right. My oldest brother was only 46, a year older than me right now. Incredible. Um, my father, unmovable faith has been a huge thing, man. And just his consistency. I mean, just consistent. You know, um, my father, the only time he would miss work is when uh, we would go on little short vacations. You know, the janitor didn't get a whole bunch of paid. No, he was, you got very few times off. So I remember that, was, but there were times I would see him go to work sick, you know, with a fever, it's flu. You know, you got some folks that will call to work today because they stayed out too late last night or, right. or just needed a me day. My dad didn't understand what a me day was. No, a me day is I'm gonna, me's gonna go to work and take care of me family. <laughs> right, <what> right, <laughs> right, respect. That's what me is gonna do today. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, just consistency. And my father, um, just a constant encourager. I mean, a constant encourage. I just had lunch, uh, breakfast with him yesterday morning. Um, and just you just walk away encouraged when you're with my dad. And he's a man who doesn't say a whole lot. You know, when he's in the pulpit, he's, he says a whole lot. Mm-hmm. You know, black preachers, man, we're going we to preach. Right. Gonna preach <laughs> but if you get him in a one-on-one setting to where you guys, he would just kind of just, he would just smile and just, you know, and just listen. He's an amazing listener. And he doesn't judge, man. Does not judge. No matter what you may have done, been through, he's never going to judge you. And that was a, those are, and that's just a few of the different things that just uh, resonate with me and my pops, man. So how does that relate to the new book that you're about to launch? Oh yeah, you know I'm glad you asked, Landon. In that my I wrote a, just wrote a book that'll be out uh, in about three weeks. That's the goal at least uh, in January, and it's called Wisdom from the Man with the Mop. Wisdom from the Man with the Mop. Mop being that my father was a janitor, had a mop quite often, mm-hmm. but it's 25 tips about to improve your life and your customer service. So regardless if you're in customer service or not, they're great tips uh, that will help you in, in various, in every area of your life as far as that goes. And I watch these characteristics from my dad. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the, uh, the first chapter is, is just nice to be nice. It's just nice to be nice. My father was cool to everybody. And you still hear, and he's been retired now for, good Lord, I don't know how many years now, and there's still people that I'll see at his former place that he cleaned. Man, your pops was amazing. Your pops was amazing. Your pops, was I don't think I've ever seen him have a bad day. We're talking about 40 plus years. And these are people saying, I don't think I've ever seen him. And I, I, I wish that could be said about me, but that's not. Now, I know he had them, but you didn't know. But you had no idea. You didn't know. He just had a resolve that was just amazing. So in that book are, are 25, and I could write one that has more than that, but for the sake of uh, simplicity mm-hmm. uh, and digest, make it a digestible book. There's 25 tips in there. 
uh, that I learned, you know, different lessons I learned from my dad, you know, from it's just nice to be nice to uh, the importance of, um, of of creating change. You know, one of the little segments in there I talk about, my father always changed the mop water, the bucket, you know, to keep the water fresh. You know, you walk around with a dirty mop bucket and stagnant, you're still using that to mop floors. Uh, you're not doing any good. You're doing a disservice to the floor and to your customer. And how often, though, we do the same thing to where we're used to something, uh, our thinking's old and antiquated and it's got it dirty or it's out of date, and we keep using it and wonder why we keep getting the same dirty result. you got to freshen things up. you got to be willing to change. Change your mop water. Change your thinking. Change your ideas at times. You know, so that's in there. A great metaphor. Uh, yeah, there's a number of, of things in there that relate to cleaning but relate to life. You know, hey. so that'll yeah. be out in about three weeks. That's incredible. I'm so excited to read that. Likewise, uh, wow, that's going to be, that is going to be a great, great book. I can already, because I'm, just the way you talk about your dad, and I've obviously, I'm getting a chance to meet him here today. Mm -hmm. I'm blessed with that opportunity. And I don't know, man, he's made an incredible son. I, I've, I'm blown away by your just your level of energy that you bring to this. It's so obvious that you're passionate about what you do. <laughs> and I pray for everybody that like when they go and, you know, do like you said, I'm going to camp, I'm going to camp hard. Like yeah. I'm, if I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the gym and go to the gym hard. Like That's right. I hope everyone reaches out in their life. And that kind of leads me to my last couple of questions here. So the last, last couple, we'll start with one. How do you define success? You know, I would define success and it's going to be maybe, I'm not saying it different than anybody else's, but when you have peace, Mm -hmm. To me, success is not anything material. Those are, to me, are, um, could be residue of success, if you would, uh, byproducts of it. Uh, but if, 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 a, if a thing that's an object becomes success to you, you are going to be very empty when it comes down to it. To me, ultimate success is finding peace in doing what you do and using your God-given abilities and talents, regardless of what that may be. Uh, it's not a dollar sign, because I know a lot of people who have a lot of dollar signs but have zero peace. Mm -hmm. So it's not about the stuff. It's about the state of mind, the peace that you get from it. So to me, true success is when you have peace of mind, body, and spirit. You people can make it say that sounds, oh, that sounds kind of, you know, uh, Pollyannish or whatever. No, no, that's truth to me. Mm -hmm. Peace, true success is when you have peace within yourself. And usually the byproducts of that are mean you're running that business you wanted to run. You wrote that book. You're being the best mom or dad you can be, the best teacher, garbage man, doctor, lawyer, uh, barista, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. To me, that is what peace is. Peace looks very different for a lot of people, but peace, it's, success looks like different, I, I, I add it, to different people. But peace is pretty, is pretty universal. You know it when you see it. You know it when you see it. Yeah. You know, so it's not about the stuff. It's about the state of mind you get to. And so uh, success looks like different things uh, and how it's achieved. But peace, you know it when you see it. Absolutely. And so when you're gone, you know, when, when your time has expired, you've had, you know, those penalties you talk about when eventually life runs out for you, what's something that you want the world to remember you by? What do you want your legacy to be? You know that he changed the world one attitude at a time. He loved God, he loved his family, and he loved life. Wow. That's... And everything else will take care of itself if those three things be held true. There's nothing I can say at that point that's going to end this in a better way. So thank you so much for Thank coming you, on, brother. dude. I, I appreciate you so much and what you're doing and how you're affecting change in the community. Like I've, I've actually w witnessed, you know, witnessed you uh, at a couple of speaking engagements and just watch the fire that you bring to that room. I appreciate it. Bro. And that's exactly why you're on this show is because you took your spark to a fire, your concept and your vision to a reality and you're changing the world with it. I appreciate and it. And I, I appreciate you coming on here, man. And to our audience, thank you guys for your time and attention today. You can find us at Spark to Fire Podcast. Please leave us a review on iTunes. That's how we move up in the rankings. And as always, keep striking. Keep striking.